Welcome to Iowa City Public Library. I'm delighted that you're here today. Welcome to our second 2002 Carol Spaziani Intellectual Freedom Festival program. My name is Carol Logston. I'm the Community and Audiovisual Services Coordinator here at the library. We're very excited about the Intellectual Freedom Festival programs this year. We have a lot of uh, neat programs, a lot of good information that will be shared this year. Um, we are live on the library channel. I want to say hi to our viewers at home and remind you that if you see a program and don't see the whole thing or you want to see it again, um, they're always replayed on the library channel. And the library channel schedules are available in the local newspapers. They're available on Iowa City Public Library's webpage, icpl.org, or you can always call the library's information. AV desk uh, to find out when a program will be played. So our topic today is rating the movies, value added information, industry self-regulation or censorship. And I'm going to turn the program over to Beth Fisher, who is our AV librarian. Thank you. Hi, thanks for coming today. Um, as Kara said, today we're going to talk about rating the movies. And in general, what we're going to talk about is the MPAA rating system. Um, before we get into that, I want to introduce our panel. Um, going from closest to me over, we have Louis Schwartz. Louis teaches contemporary U.S. cinema at the University of I Iowa, where he's an assistant professor in the Department of Cinema and Comparative Lit. Louis has a Ph.D. from the University of Iowa and a B.A. from UC Berkeley. He's currently working on a book about film and video evidence in U.S. court. Louis will discuss censorship versus industrial self-regulation. Next to Louie is Lane Wyrick. Lane graduated from the film school at the University of Iowa in 1990 and then spent four years learning the craft of professional production in Los Angeles. He returned to his hometown of Iowa City in 1995 to, po to form Zap Interactive Incorporated, an all-digital video and DVD production company, to create original documentary, narrative, visual art, and corporate productions. His documentary, The Nazi Drawings, won several national awards and he is beginning a new documentary on the life of Iowa legend Bill Schachter. Most recently, he was appointed chairman of the Iowa City International Documentary Festival. Next to Lane is Todd Leach. Todd Leach is the owner of the New Strand Theater in West Liberty. Todd graduated from the University of Iowa with a degree in film in 1993 and has worked at the AV department of the Iowa City Public Library since 1994 as a technical wizard behind this channel, Channel 10. Um, in 1996, Todd purchased the New Strand Theater in West Liberty. In what little spare time he has left, he's worked on two feature films, American Job and American Movie. Todd's going to give us the independent theater owner's perspective of the MPA rating system. And last but not least is Barb Black. Barb has been a librarian at the Iowa City Public Library since 1988 as a materials selector, reference librarian, young adult librarian, and cataloger. She's currently serving as the coordinator of the Technical Services Department. Barb is a graduate of Michigan State University and the University of Iowa's School of Library and Information Science, where she's also served as an adjunct instructor. She's going to talk about the MPAA rating system from the library's perspective and from the American Library Association's perspective. Now I get the fun part. I'm going to give a quick and dirty history of how we got to the rating system. Um, and it really is quick. In the 1890s, moving pictures were known as kin kinetoscopes. I can never say that word right. They were basically coin-operated viewers that one person could look at at a time, and they had short little loops of film. In 1896, the first film was projected to a group of people. So you went from an individual use to a group use. In 1903, the silent classic film The Great Train Robbery was released. In 1905, the first Nickelodeon opened in Pittsburgh. It cost you five cents to go in and see a movie projected. Within a week, newspaper critics in Pittsburgh were calling the Nickelodeon morally objectionable and calling for censorship. In 1911, the state of Pennsylvania formed the first state censorship board. In 1913, Ohio and Kansas formed censorship boards. In 1915, the three-hour-long silent film, The Birth of a Nation, was released. And that same year, the United States Supreme Court upheld the rights of states to form censorship boards. They declared that motion pictures, as well as live theater, were commercial entities and thus not subject to free speech protection. In 1921, the state of New York formed a state censorship board. 
That was a censorship board that would cover the largest motion picture market in America. The motion picture industry decided it was time to act. The heads of the seven of the largest motion picture companies got together and formed the MPPDA, which stands for, <coughs> excuse me, the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America. They offered the job of president to Will Hayes, who at the time was Postmaster General of the U.S. Hayes had been the chairman of the Republican National Committee and had been instrumental in getting Hollywood involved in the successful election campaign of Warren G. Harding. Excuse me. <coughs> Um, Hayes' experience with government, as well as the motion picture industry, made him idea for the job. In 1923, Hayes came out with a now famous list of 13 don'ts and be carefuls for filmmakers. If filmmakers followed this list, they should be able to release a film that a censor wouldn't challenge. Um, in that list, it included things like pointed profanity, nudity, drugs, and ridicule of the clergy or law enforcement. In 1930, a new production code was created that might, they might actually be able to enforce. It was called the Code to Govern the Making of Talking, Synchronized, and Silent Motion Pictures, effectively known as the Hayes Code. I printed a copy of it. It's nine pages long. Um, the first principle listed is that no picture shall be produced that will lower the moral standards of those who see it. And it goes for nine pages talking about things like obscenity, profanity, costume, dances, religion, um, the use of bedrooms in a scene. And it tells you what you can and can't do. It's pretty pointed. Um, but when it was first released, there was no way to enforce it. Um, four years later, within the MPPDA, they formed something called the Production Code Ad Administration Office to enforce the code. And this code remained in force until the 60s, when Jack Valenti became the president of the, it was now called the MPAA, Motion Picture Association of America. Um, and in 1968, Valenti got rid of this code and came out with the first version of the code we know today. Now I'm going to turn it over to Louie, and he can go from there. Hi. <clears throat> the first thing I did I guess anybody else would do nowadays when uh, Beth asked me to do this was go uh, and look on the web. So uh, I found the MPAA uh, website. Uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting site for a lot of reasons. Um, it, it tells you how they see themselves and how they, they want you to think of them. And so if you look on the site, they call themselves the voice and advocate of the American motion picture home video and television industries. And it, they also go out of their way to tell you that the, the current board of directors includes the chairman and president of the seven major producers of distributors of motion pictures and television programs in the United States. These members include the Walt Disney Company, Sony Pictures Entertainment Incorporated, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Incorporated, Paramount Pictures Corporation, 20th Century Fox Film Corporation, Universal Studios Incorporated, and Warner Brothers Studios Incorporated. These are not seven entities that care one way or the other about your intellectual freedom. They care about their bottom line. They are for-profit organizations. That's the most important thing to understand about the organization that controls the rating system. According to the MPAA's president, Jack Valenti's account, also on the MPAA website, the, quote, social change and torment of the late 1960s, including, and this is his list, insurrection on the campuses, riots in the streets, the rise in women's liberation, protest of the young, doubts about it, the institution of marriage, abandonment of old guiding slogans, and the crumbling of social tradition, changed the movies and left us with films that had very few self-imposed restraints. Now, something happened in the late 60s that produced a bunch of movies with fewer self-imposed restraints than had been the case during the production code. But whether it has anything to do with the social climate of the time is rather dubious. The solution to this, <coughs> to this lack of constraints, uh, came, uh, started coming in about 1966, uh, and it started coming when Jack Valenti first realized there was a problem with the old code. 
which was around the uh, release and the attempt to get a rating, uh, uh, to get a code approval, pardon me, not a rating, that hadn't started, uh, to get the code seal uh, for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which contained um, the word screw, which was, and also hump the hostess were two of the phrases that were most hotly contested by the MPAA. And they compromised and decided to get rid of screw and keep hump the hostess. You can. Uh, you can see Richard Burton say, hump the hostess in, in the version that's out today. The same year, uh, MGM was uh, denied the seal, the code seal, for uh, Michelangelo Antonioni's film Blow Up. And uh, they released it nonetheless under a subsidiary company. The effect of that was to violate the code agreement or to flaunt the code agreement because the company that released it was actually owned by MGM and MGM was simply not supposed to release films uh, according to their MPAA membership agreement that didn't have a code seal of approval. And further uh, complicating the situation, uh, two years later in 1968, uh, there was a Supreme Court decision which Valenti does not name uh, on the website. The name of the Supreme Court decision in question was the United States versus I am curious yellow. And the Supreme Court decision, according to Valenti, was a decision that allowed schools and towns and libraries to deny children access to materials adults could not be kept from seeing or reading or consuming. And this, according to Valenti, forced him and his colleagues at the MCAA, uh, M yeah, at the MPAA, to uh, develop the rating system. In fact, the main point of the decision wasn't that schools, towns, libraries, and other local states and local government forms could ban, could ban films from children, but that they could not ban a film like I Am Curious Yellow, which Valenti doesn't tell us at all. It was simply, such films were simply now part of the market. So what is I Am Curious Yellow? It's basically a Swedish coming of age film with more or less explicit lovemaking scenes. And again, it could not be barred from being shown. That's the content of the decision. The, uh, the decision to allow uh, minors from being prevented from, to be prevented uh, from viewing this material was uh, an ancillary part of, um, of, that, of that decision and, and not at all the main thrust. This can be found on the Supreme Court's website and on LexisNexis, the entire decision. So it's easy to take a look at uh, for oneself. Um, and so one can tell uh, from, uh, from the, the, the way Valenti writes that the small amount of concern that he expresses uh, in his history of the rating system for intellectual freedom, uh, that in, in the fact that he avoids any mention of the title of the film or any direct citation of the case containing its name and constructs the case as a case about protecting children, which it's not at all. Um, according to Valenti, the code was abolished because it wasn't working and the voluntary rating system took its place to make sure that all movies could be seen, but only by audiences who could handle them. Thus, the rating system was a means of industry self-regulation that preserved intellectual freedom, if one is to believe what he has to say on the website. To see why this is a problematic or, to be blunt, less than true account, we need to ask why a Swedish coming-of-age film was suddenly being imported into the United States and shown in the kinds of theaters where it came to the attention of those who raised an objection to it. How did this come to pass? To do that, you have to know a little bit about what kind of condition Hollywood was in uh, between the end of World War II and 1968. So at the end of World War II, the studios faced a variety of economic problems, and I'm not going to give you a complete account because that would take far too long. But first there was the U.S. Supreme Court's Paramount Decree of 1948, which was enforced progressively in the years after that. And what this decree did was it made a practice called block booking illegal in the first place, so that studios could no longer require theater chains and independent theater owners to take more than one film uh, by the studio in order to get any at all. Um, this, they also, the decree also made uh, the ownership of theater chains by studios illegal. Those two parts of the decision meant that what had been a guaranteed market for studio films, you own a chain of theaters, 
you show them the films you make and the theaters you own. You don't have to go seek a market for your films. That was gone, that guaranteed marketplace. To make matters uh, worse, when GIs came back from the war and uh, had a little money from their army paid and then improved their income substantially by going to college on the GI Bill, one of their first reactions to a little bit more wealth was to move their families out of the cities and towards the suburbs. This was a problem for Hollywood because Hollywood had built the theater chains that the studios owned in the urban centers because that's where the people were. That's now uh, where the consumers weren't. And to make matters worth, worse, in the suburbs, um, a whole bunch of new entertainment and recreation activities emerge. The famous one is television, which turns out to be a more complicated case and is generally known. I think people tend to assume that when te television in the early 50s starts achieving market penetration, it's bad for the studios. It's bad for theater owners is who it's bad for because the studios quickly start selling product to the broadcasters and forming alliances with them and then forming the same business and then becoming parts of the same corporate entities as them. Uh, so television is complicated but two things that took people away from the movies oddly which we still do today are gardening and golf. These were very important hobbies that people did instead of going to movie theaters. So how did the studios respond to this? Well, they start making fewer and fewer films for more, and investing more and more money in each film, requiring at least some of those expensive, uh, some of those few expensive films to make a huge profit. And, and thus, uh, that has something to do with intellectual freedom because it restricted what kinds of films could be made in a new way. The studios started emphasizing, because it was commercially more sustainable, huge investment films uh, that would make a huge profit. So the films, for example, couldn't be too controversial, which they also couldn't be under the code. But now, instead of being uh, something that was regulated by a code, it was regulated by commercial concerns, which I would argue are always more powerful than some form of self-regulation that's merely a, a rule on paper. In the pre-World War II days of the old studio system, uh, studios could rely on the average profit from all the films uh, that, they, uh, that they released into their guaranteed market. Um, the production code in that context makes a lot of sense um, in, the, in the context of the pre-war market because all the films have to be presentable in any theater in the chain, give or take a few. But in the post-war economy, especially as the 20th century wore on, only some films had to be appropriate for every theater. This gave rise not only to the blockbuster, but also to niche marketing of films. As an example, the most constant big money makers over the past few years have been films like Shrek, aimed at children and their parents and rated G. But some money can also be made through films whose content is thought to be inappropriate for small children. The rating system creates various marketing niches for the films and tells you which niche the film is aimed at. In the late 1960s, the studios were in extremely bad financial conditions. Ticket sales declined or remained flat every year between 1965 until 1972 when The Godfather almost single-handedly saved Hollywood from this, uh, from this recessionary uh, economy that it found itself stuck in. The strategy of making few more expensive films <clears throat> that had worked um, at the beginning of the post-war era and having them uh, turn a high profit fast had completely stalled by the late 60s. Uh, so in 1967, Dr. Doolittle was made for $18 million, and it lost $11 million. Uh, in 1968, uh, sorry, in 1969, Hello, Dolly! was released. It, it was the most expensive film, and this will teach you a little about inflation in Hollywood. It was the most expensive film ever made in Hollywood in, 19, in 1969. It had cost $26.4 million to make, which by today's standard is very little. Um, it lost $16 million upon release. Uh, and there are, there's, I could you know, go on with a long list of money-losing uh, films that were meant to make a lot of money quickly and had a lot of money 
invested in them. This creates a number of problems. Simply losing money is one of them. The other big one is that the studios had a lot of capital tied up in these films that they didn't know how to release, that they were reluctant to even release around this time. The industry responds to this in a variety of ways. The one with the greatest effect on intellectual freedom by far is a series of mergers between studios and corporations from around the world whose business wasn't film. So, 1966, Paramount is taken over by Gulf Western. United Artists is bought by Transmedia in 67. Warner Brothers is taken over by Kinney National Services in 69. The same year, MGM is bought by a real estate tycoon. While the new parent companies provided an infusion of desperately needed cash to the studios, they know little about the film business and tend to see the studios when they first buy them and it, as essentially tax shelters. Um, as corporations bought more studios, uh, broadcasters and record companies and news outlets, media ownership becomes constrained um, and concentrated into the hands of a few, which has had a devastating effect on our ability to, to say anything publicly in this country in a mass market. Um, that's the real problem of intellectual freedom in Hollywood. Now, in addition to selling themselves off, the studios diversified the kinds of films they made and imported. Um, and this is the beginning of real niche marketing. Uh, art films, exploitation films, and inexpensive offbeat films like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid from 1969, MASH from 1970, that collectively become known as the new American cinema do better than the rest of the market. I Am Curious Yellow was imported um, it, it imported as such an attempt at, at niche marketing in, pa in part on the basis of the success of Claude Lelouch's 1966 uh, A Man and a Woman, a sexy art film, um, and in part on the success of previous exploitation films by uh, a company that wasn't a movie studio. It was Grove Press that released the film in the United States, which should warm the heart of librarians everywhere, I think. Um, <laughs> It brought it in in 1968, and it does $20.2 million at the box office, stunning almost everyone um, and upsetting those people who would censor such films. So what this means is that the niche market at this point has overtaken the blockbuster. Now, the need to keep the market open for these films is what drove the rating system and is responsible for its persistence. The stalling of the blockbuster was caused by the segmentation of the movie audience into different groups, the youth market, the family market, the art house market. There was no longer one audience that an expensive film could address. And there weren't even multiple audiences who could all be made to see the same film uh, through having that same film appeal to different groups in different ways. Um, at least techniques of appealing to different groups weren't yet sophisticated enough for that to be a successful Hollywood strategy. Uh, in ratings, it, the ratings were one of the several were one of several ways of indicating which film was aimed at which audience. Advertising, choosing theaters, which theaters to release a film in, um, and other mechanisms were also used for this. And if you, if you think about the fact that this is the period when porn theaters start to proliferate in urban centers, just wh where which location a film shows in be it showed in, became a way of marking what kind of film it was. And this really starts in the late 60s, early, early 70s. Since The Godfather in 1972 and Jaws in 1975 resuscitated the blockbuster as a way of making money in Hollywood, intellectual freedom's been controlled by the need to market films to as wide an audience as possible and as quickly as possible. So that again, anything that's too, too really too disturbing won't be part of a film that's mass marketed and the, the budget just for the marketing part of these big films is often approaches the cost of making the films themselves. So, for example, if you remember after September 11th, several films were suppressed for a while, Schwarzenegger's collateral damage, because it was thought that it simply wouldn't play to enough different audiences. People would be too upset to watch a film about terrorism for it to be worth advertising the film right away. That's what that's about. Not that I'm putting collateral damage up as an example of an assertion of intellectual freedom, exactly. <laughs> this means that these films uh, should pander to everyone, the big films, while offending no ones, in other words. Ratings still function to indicate niche markets, meanwhile, even the NC-17 rating. NC-17 is a funny rating from this point of view because it, it curtails which theaters will play the film. So in the, th in, the, in the theater market, you know, you go see the film somewhere outside your home, project it on film and like that. 
it's really damaging to get an NC-17 rating uh, with respect to how much money you make off the film. But on the video market, NC-17 is a plus because the video, mar video stores rarely control who gets to see them. And people think they're seeing a little bit of something they can't get in the theater, something they can only have access to in a home format, DVDs uh, or tape. And so it actually enhances sales um, and rentals on, on those markets. These economic circumstances are the opposite of any kind of intellectual autonomy or artistic autonomy. Um, so we have now the focus group the test screening, product placement, and versions edited for content by video chains, technologies, new technologies like movie mass and clean flicks that will digitally fix offen offensive portions of uh, a movie shown at home. You plug it between your TV and your VCR or your DVD player, and it'll do things like putting a corset on Kate Winslet in the drawing scene of Titanic, if that's too upsetting for you. Um, these technologies both originate in, in, from companies that are based in Utah, and uh, one of them has strong affiliations with the Mormon church, so there's a religious drive uh, to do this. Um, and the other thing that these devices will do is they will allow advertisers to buy uh, buy access to the device through essentially a cable signal. Uh, through a modem signal that will place a product into select scenes of a film so that you can, you could, you could, it's conceivable that you could get a circumstance where, uh, where uh, Humphrey Bogart in, um, in The Maltese Falcon is drinking a Coke or, or explicitly smoking a Camel cigarette or something like that. That would be rather easy to do. Um, what limits intellectual, my, my basic point is that what limits our intellectual freedom in contemporary U.S. cinema isn't so much the rating system as the fact that most films in movie theaters cost at least $10 million and expect to turn a profit and a quick profit. It's as if, if you imagine Kafka as a filmmaker trying to make a film of, of the trial today, he would very quickly be told, no one will understand why this guy's on trial for something you can't say what it is. You should make it clear what crime he's accused of committing. That'll make the film more available to, more accessible to people and, you know, we can actually afford to make it and market it then. That's, that's the real block, I think. Um. As a filmmaker, I come from maybe a slightly different perspective. Um, uh, first of all, one of the things like what you're talking about with the books, uh, I mean the different the, the cost of production is, is obviously a major consideration. Um, you have with writing a book, you have freedom to type whatever you want. You have you know you can spend days and days, but you're just all all you have uh, in terms of the production. Uh, invested in the production is a word processor and your time and it's in filmmaking is much more of a, a group participation type uh, process um, so basically uh, there there I've seen all kinds of movies you know and whether or not it makes money whether it's a 10 million dollar Hollywood flick or a hundred million dollar or whether it's an independent production um, I've seen pretty much everything that you can imagine, and, and I, I think that the rating system is actually a good thing. I think that um, what, what the original code is, it's not preventing anyone who's over 18 from seeing anything that they, you know, pretty much anyone can do. All the MPAA code is is a, a guide for parents to uh, be able to have an idea and an education of what what's in this film. Um, I give an example of uh, my wife and I went to a film festival, um, and we didn't know what we were going to see. And all of a sudden, they sh show, started showing some really shocking graphic, uh, basically pornographic images, really quickly. And it was it was just it was startling, you know, for the audience. We had no indication that anything like that was going to happen. Had we known, we might have said, "Well, okay, uh, we'll go some, you know, we'll go to a different uh, part of this and see something a little bit, you know." So. There's no indication uh, with, you know, in some of these film festivals, they don't they don't uh, carve out a niche for saying, uh, okay, this is going to be some movies that are going to have stronger content, or and this is not. It's just like you're assaulted. So if, uh, like, if I were to have children that were coming there and seeing this, then then it would be very shocking. You know, if a kid wants to get into an NC-17 movie, just like, you know, 
getting a can of beer or something like that, they can figure out ways to do it. It's just it really serves as a guide. Um, originally what the uh, MPA did was they started out with, after they threw away the Hayes Code, they started out with rated G, uh, rated M, which was mature, which was actually became PG later, um, rated R, and then rated X, and then they felt that rated X after a while was uh, um, something that uh, people just associate with, with pornography, so they changed it to NC-17 to kind of give it more artistic flair. I don't, you know, when I'm uh, making choices as a filmmaker, when I'm shooting something, uh, first of all, you write the script, you have everything planned out in front of you. So if I decide, well, I want to have someone swear, I've got that written down on paper. You know, if I want to have a scene of violence, I've got that figured out. So I can pretty much know from my blueprint, from my script, whether or not you know this is going to get a certain rating or one one rating or another so if i want to make something that's like a horror film which i, I won't do but but if i want to do like a horror film or something that's an exploitation th thing thing uh you know i pretty much know what the kind of ratings are, are i'm going to get even though they say that basically rated pg movies pg-13 or r movies uh those are the general money makers if you get an nc-17 rating um you, you basically, you supply your film to the MPAA board, they vote on it, and then you can, there's an appeals process, so that you can, you can say, well, this is the reason why I don't think that this should be rated NC-17. Um, but uh, it's all marketing, you know. I could, I could put out, you can also put your movie out unrated, so, or you can rate it anything else. The MPAA has copyrighted, you know, G, PG, PG-13, R, and NC-17. So I could rate it, uh, rated uh, F for, you know, fun time or something, you know, I don't know, but, or, 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 you know, just whatever, uh, B for beware of this movie, that kind of thing, um, but something that you can, or just not rated, you know, so um, I'm, I'm not sure I have to look into it, but I know that, like, when the movie Dawn of the Dead came out, they said, this movie isn't rated, um, come to see this midnight thing, and so then everyone was like, oh, we got to go see this movie and everything, so, so, uh, so you can put a movie out unrated. So I, I personally don't, I don't think that, um, you know, I mean, the, the reason why these $100 million movies uh, are cost so much is because the people, they have to have a marketing hook if they're going to do a saturation marketing. They, they want to have, a, you know, if you get this bombardment three weeks in advance where everywhere there's, there's uh, you know, billboards up, advertising every, every 30 seconds, you know, you see an ad for this movie. They want to get, get as many people to go in because they've invested a lot of money in. There's certain marketing hooks. You know, you can have a, a, a good actor because it, really what it comes down to, to me more, is, is not, you know, ratings or, or content. It has to do with how can you sell a movie uh, uh, through saturation marketing in 30 seconds, you know. And, and so, unfortunately, a lot of movies get overlooked, but that's just because they cost too much. But I could personally shoot on digital video <laughs> Uh, and, and eventually have it transferred to film for under like under twenty thousand dollars, make a feature film about I absolutely anything I wanted. And if you pursue it, you can get it out. You know, you may not be able to get it on television and market it to everywhere, but but you can get it out to people if you want to, and you can express your creative freedom. So I would I think that uh, um, you know instead of having the Hayes Code, which says you can't do this, you can't do that. It, all this is is a guideline to say this is, you know, on this end of the scale or that end of the scale, this is where this picture lies so that parents can inform their children. So, um, you know, and, and I do think that it's also allowing, films are becoming more violent and something that would, would have been considered rated, rated R uh, before now is PG-13, you know, it's just a bombardment of ultra violence and things like that. That's just a selling concept to me, um, and I think that uh, I, I think the the rating system should, uh, you know, will just like when in 1984 when Indiana Jones Temple of Doom came out, there was uh, people said, "Wow, this there's a lot of violence in here." So they they decided, well, we'll make PG-13 to say, okay, it's halfway between PG and R. Well, it may and maybe they'll come out with a new thing, uh, you know, that's between you know, PG-13 and R or different things like that, you know, it, it, it's something that needs to develop, but I just think it's really an indicator of specifically uh, what kind of content a, a parent should expect if, if their kids are going to go to this. 
there's a lot of parents out there that don't care, you know, let your kids see whatever they want. I think that has a detrimental effect if parents aren't aware of what their kids are watching. But um, I don't think it, you know, I think the rating system is just something that, there that's important. If we took it away, it would be end up like that film festival where you'd go and all of a sudden you'd be really shocked and you're in a movie theater and you wouldn't know what to expect. And I, I wouldn't put that on, on children, uh, you know, I mean, it, Adults can see whatever they want, and this isn't preventing them from that. So that's what I have to say. Well, being in uh, film exhibition, the, the rating system is an integral part of my business. Every film has a rating, and if all you know is the title and the rating, you can make a generalization about what the content of the film will be. However, this can get you in trouble because the categories for G, PG, PG-13, R, and NC-17 are very broad. Um, an example of a uh, G film, um, the uh, straight story, if you didn't know anything about uh, that, you would want to take your kids and, and maybe see some bunnies and, and things like that. And, be surprised that it's an old guy driving a tractor across Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, as an example of some of the stuff that falls into the, the PG-13 rating, I printed off uh, the, the movies from my website, uh, current and coming up. Uh, Signs had a PG-13 rating, uh, PG-13 for some frightening moments. The Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood, PG-13, for mature thematic elements, language, and brief sensuality. And The Four Feathers, PG-13, for intense battle sequences, disturbing images, violence, and some sensuality. So there's a lot that falls into those categories. And if knowing the content is important to you, you need more information. Um, there has been a push to get the rating information um, out to people by including it um, on, the mo on the movie posters itself. Uh, this has been pretty slow and only a few companies do it on a regular basis. Um, that puts the burden back on the distributor to relay the, or the exhibitor to relay the information. And I've been doing it for quite a while through my website and also on the phone message system. If you still feel you need more information about a film's content, there's a website uh, called screenit.com. This breaks the film's content down into um, very precise categories and will tell you uh, whether, uh, for example, if uh, drinking is is heavy, moderate, or non-existent, or um, it, it'll basically tell you everything and more than you wanted to know about the film. <laughs> <laughs> Another issue I deal with um, is enforcing the rating system. Although particip participation in the rating system is voluntary, it's strongly encouraged. The only ratings I enforce are the R rating and the NC-17. Um, if I had to enforce a PG-13 rating, I think parents would revolt and, and storm the theater. <laughs> uh, being a single screen theater, um, enforcement for me isn't much of an issue because either the person is old enough to buy the ticket or they aren't. Um, at a multiplex, the enforcement is usually pretty good at the box office, but uh, uh, that uh, underage person will just figure out that they can buy a ticket for a PG or PG-13 movie, and uh, later, once they're in the complex, just sneak into that R-rated movie they wanted to go to in the first place. Ratings enforcements are kind of a sore spot with exhibitors because they're turning down a sale. And to properly enforce the R rating, they need another employee to monitor who gets in the auditorium 
uh, which also costs them money. And theaters already operate on a very thin profit margin, and every penny counts. The final issue I have to deal with um, is marketing materials, more commonly known as trailers. Recently, Hollywood's come under fire for marketing our movies to teens. Uh, and because the tobacco companies were sued for marketing their products to teens, there is precedence. Uh, marketing promotions changed overnight, and R-rated horror movies that were prominently marketed on MTV disappeared. This also uh, happened in theaters, uh, and a policy of not showing R-rated trailers on films with G and PG ratings was adopted. Now, this is kind of common sense to me. Um, I try and program my trailers to uh, complement the show that I'm playing, although um, a lot of the movie companies uh, release with their movie, um, upcoming movies, they're, they're actually attached to the print, um, unlike a separate trailer. And there were some instances of uh, PG movies coming out with uh, R-rated uh, trailers attached to them. Um, being last in line uh, to get trailers um, Programming appropriate trailers is often a challenge for me. Another interesting fact about movie trailers, you see uh, there's red and green band trailers. Uh, green band trailers are approved for a, a general audience, and red band trailers are approved only to run with a feature of the same rating. Um, and. Uh, in conclusion, uh, remember that uh, the movies are a product. Uh, know the product that you're buying, and um, always accompany your children to a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and buy popcorn. And buy popcorn. And buy popcorn. <laughs> I'll just, I just want to provide a little bit of background to give some context to the library's perspective on use, the use of rating systems in, in uh, library records and whether or not we enforce them as part of our um, library policies. Um, libraries are a marketplace of free ideas. Uh, it's, it's our mission. And uh, in 1938, the Public Library of Des Moines, uh, the director of the Public Library of Des Moines, in response to what seemed to be a growing um, intolerance and a move toward censorship and uh, suppression of free speech, really worldwide, uh, it, within the context of the beginning of the, or just prior to the beginning of the World War II. Um, in response to that, the Public Library of Des Moines, uh, the Board of Trustees um, adopted what was called a Library Bill of Rights. And um, it's, it should be a sense of pride to Iowans that um, what started it here as a uh, foundation of intolerance and to support libraries' commitment to being a marketplace of ideas, um, really, through revisions, has been adopted nationwide by the American Library Association. And though, as I mentioned, it has had a few revisions over the years, um, it's still a document that's the foundation of what we do now. I've got copies of the Library Bill of Rights, if you're interested, um, placed on the table over there. A, a couple of the um, principles, there are, there are six listed here. A couple that are particularly pertinent to this issue are that books and other library resources should be provided for the interest, information, and enlightenment of all people of the community the library serves. Materials should not be excluded because of the origin, background, or views of those contributing to their creation. And number five, a person's right to use a library should not be denied or abridged because of origin, age, background, or views. Um, this really does remain a foundation for our um, providing access today. Um, ALA doesn't force libraries to, or librarians to um, commit to the um, Library Bill of Rights, but it's something that they encourage adoption, and libraries all over the country um, adopt these as a foundation of principles on which we act. Um, 
Over the years, uh, in response to questions from communities and to the libraries, um, the American Library Association committees have also um, issued what they called interpretations to help fully describe how the Library Bill, Bill of Rights um, applies in particular um, situations to particular types of material or to specific classes of people. Um, and for instance, there would be there's a, an excuse me an interpretation um, for resources such as meeting rooms and displays also. A couple that are particular, per, particularly pertinent to this issue. Um, the first is access for children and young people to videotapes and other non-print formats. This originally started out um, in the 1950s. There, uh, Peoria, the public library in Peoria, Illinois, had a challenge to some films in their collection, and there, the um, American Library Association um, added uh, what was it was an interpretive footnote rather than. Um, what has later evolved into this group of interpretations of the Bill of Rights. And, um, but in 1989, uh, a number of the American Library Association youth divisions um, requested review of the Library of Bill of Rights to ensure equi equitable access to minors. And thus, the, what had previously been just an interpretive footnote related to non-print materials, um, was revised to be an, an interpretation specifically aimed at not um, limiting access to videotapes and other non-print formats to children. Um, and it says a variety of things in here, but I'll just read a couple of them. Parents and only parents have the right and the responsibility to restrict the access of their children and only their children to library resources. Parent or legal guardians who do not want their children to have access to certain library services, materials, or facilities should so advise their children. Librarians and governing bodies cannot assume the role of parent or the functions of parental authority in the private relationship between parent and child. Librarians and governing bodies have a public and professional obligation to provide equal access to all library resources for all library users. And that was sort of as a preamble to um, discussing um, particularly non-print materials. It goes on to say policies which set minimum age limits for access to videotapes and or other audiovisual materials and equipment with or without par parental permission abridge library use for minors. Further, age limits based on the cost of the materials are unacceptable because oftentimes um, objections are not just based on the content of the material but also um, on how much it will cost to the parent if the child happens to damage or lose the, the non-print materials. Recognizing that libraries cannot, cannot act in loco parentis, ALA acknowledges and supports the exercise by parents of their responsibility to guide their own children's reading and viewing. MPAA and other rating services are private advisory codes and have no legal standing. For the library to add such ratings to the materials if they're not already there, to post a list of such ratings to the materials if they are not already there, to post a list of such ratings with a collection, or attempt to enforce such ratings through circulation policies or other procedures constitutes labeling, an attempt to prejudice attitudes about the, about the material and is unacceptable. And there are copies of this on the table too if anyone's interested in reading that in, in um, total. Um, it really does emphasize the importance of parents playing a role in the selection of any kinds of materials for their children and not just limited to um, non-print materials. But I think libraries are sensitive to the issue of the impact that visual images can have um, so that a child might view something. It, reading doesn't stand in the way of um, coming across a particular type of content, in other words. But um, the library uh, community and our library as well um, really does feel that it would be difficult for us to try to determine for each individual child what's appropriate or what you think is appropriate for your child. So we leave that in the hands of the parents and, uh, and otherwise do not restrict access to these materials in, other way, in any way. Um, further, uh, another interpretation that has um, some, some uh, basis in this particular discussion is the statement on labeling. And uh, again, it's an interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights that talks about um, uh, not adopting any particular systems to label things. And this came about um, really in the, at a time 
it, it was created as a response to the Sons of the American Revolution who wanted to label materials in the library um, as advocating communism. But it does have applications in the use of the MPA rating system. Um, because labeling can be a tool used by a censor um, to attempt to prejudice the use of this of the material and violating the spirit spirit of the Library Bill of Rights and the library as a, a free marketplace of ideas. Um, if a video comes into the library after our purchase, our selection, um, with on the packaging, it includes the MPAA rating, we leave it on the materials, not taking it off or expurgating it, because that really would be another form of censorship to take things out, much as CleanFlix has decided to do. Um, uh, because we leave it on the, and so we leave it on the packaging. One way in which Iowa City's library, um, some have discussed whether or not, it, we as librarians have discussed whether or not we're actually um, violating the spirit of the, um, the Library Bill of Rights is that we do actually include it in our cataloged records. Um, if the information is on the package, we do not seek it out, but we do see it as another form of information just as putting notation of a cast or a director or how long the film runs. And so it is a piece of information that we include in the cataloged record. We don't promote it. We don't point it out to parents unless, for instance, they were to ask. If a parent were to ask me at the information desk um, if there was a way for them to find out what, what movies we had that were PG rated, it's a very easy um, thing to do with an online catalog, and I'd be able to describe that to them. But we don't, um, in fact, put, make the ratings more prominent. Um, and finally, um, there's another document that I'll mention, uh, and which we also have copies on the table, and that's the freedom to view statement. And really, it's just an eloquent application of the First Amendment to access to visual materials, and I invite you to read that. Um, a democracy really is built on an informed citizenry with free access to ideas, and libraries provide that marketplace, and we feel strongly about our commitment to that. Uh, However, um, we support parents' rights and their responsibilities to monitor and to um, help their children choose what they choose to use. So the MPAA in our, um, within our um, purview is really just value-added information. It's a piece of information that parents can either use or ignore, but otherwise um, we don't take any responsibility for, just as we're not endorsing the views of any of our print materials, we're uh, the the non-print collections are free for use by anyone as well. Okay, now we'll open it up to questions if there are any. I learned a lot myself. <laughs> Anybody have questions? Um, I'm kind of curious when I go to video stores or I tend to check out a lot of the non-fiction videos at the library, I'm curious, I mean, what portion of the filmmaking business doesn't rate? Because I'm always intrigued by the things that I find that are unrated. I mean, any sense? I mean, is there like 10% of the business, 20% of the business? Does it all depend on what the genre is? I, oh, I was going to say, I, I, you know, there's been a big rise in independent filmmaking, and so there's a lot of material out there. For instance, like, my documentary, The Nazi Drawings, which is here, which has some strong graphic content, um, scenes of the Holocaust, it's not rated because uh, it's a short documentary and it's also, uh, you know, you have to pay money to have your film rated. And so it, that's a process, you know, you have to send it in in front of the MPAA board and then they, they vote on it and everything. So, so you can't just, you, you can't say it's PG-13 because that's a copyrighted term actually there. So, so you have to pay to get it rated. So a lot of these independent films, things that you see on the internet, things like that, that's why they're not rated at all. So. Is it a pro-rated kind of thing depending on what the I don't know actually, we were talking about that. that uh, we don't, actually we were talking about that earlier um, before the meeting and, and we're not sure. I'll probably look into it today though, <laughs> so find out. So. A lot of the non-fiction material you come across may be rated in some other way than the, than the MPAA ratings. Like, a lot of uh, documentary film is meant for, to, to, well, not meant for, but ends up on TV, and a lot of it is conveniently packaged in a TV-friendly length. 
Um, so that stuff all, well, almost all, has some kind of indication of which audience it's appropriate for that the broadcaster affixed to it, which by the time it gets to you probably disappears from the, from the packaging. So most, most people that make a movie with a, the intent to put it in more than a few theaters, and I'm talking commercial theaters here, um, will try to have their films rated because not rated films play in many fewer theaters. Many theaters and many chains especially have a policy of not playing unrated films or NC-17 films. I actually was going to ask you, on the, on the uh, uh, movie trailers, the, you can advertise a rated R film, but still have it edited. It's a, the right. content of the trailer right. itself, the right? So, mm -hmm. okay. Susan. <laughs> well, one of the messages I hear you saying is that, that to pay attention to what it is you're going to be viewing and try and learn about it. And I'm frustrated sometimes trying to figure out, I mean, because what they're doing is marketing to you and or marketing to whoever they've chosen to market to. And that I find that sometimes really not very valuable information. I mean, in the trailer, they can show you every violent or sex-filled scene, and then you go to the two-hour movie and it was very, really a very minuscule part of the whole show. And so through, they're not giving you information, they're marketing. And, and so you rely on things like reviews and, and things like that to decide what movie you want to go see. It's, it's frustrating to find out the content of movies. I'm a book person, and I'm used to reading the blur, flipping through the book. You don't get to do that with movies. I guess, I don't know if there's a question in there or not. But it, it sounds like you get a lot of literary pleasure out of reading, right? So right. The, the key for you is to find reviewers, exactly, who write in a way that you like. And there are so many now different kinds of reviewers now that the web is an important source of film reviews. And I'm sure you can find like three different ones who give you pretty good coverage of a lot of different kinds of movies that... It wouldn't be it wouldn't be a drag to actually read the review just to try and get the information out of there, but you'd actually like the the person's writing style. As long as they don't give away the ending, right? <laughs> some, some people like even like the spoiler. Yeah. And I'm going to jump in here. We also have a whole section out there of review guides to books and to videos and a few even to DVDs, uh, which will give you a review. Some by well-known magazine or newspaper reviewers like e, uh, Siskel and Ebert or whatever, but they are out there. And while they may not have today's box office, we try and keep pretty current. So check them out at the library. Heidi? What are the consequences for a theater that does not enforce the age limits and the ratings? Um, there's really no consequence. Save these to a library. <laughs> It's um, always been a voluntary system. Um, there were some rumblings uh, to make it, uh, make the rating system into law. And I have problems with that um, uh, simply because there's a lot worse things a teenager can do besides seeing an R rated movie. And you're a small town, your movie is community theater. Is there a community pressure? Do you think there'd be community pressure if you were recklessly letting people in to R and NC-17? No, uh, actually. <laughs> <laughs> when I bought the theater, uh, the previous owner told me they didn't restrict um, for R ratings. And I started out that way. And it, it, for me, it was a nightmare. <laughs> I'm, the kids would come, and it would just be their party. Um, and anybody else who came and really wanted to watch the movie really couldn't. And um, I think it's, it's helped me um, to use the restriction in that way. Carol. I wanted to ask uh, whoever would like to comment to comment on the purpose of the film festival. Uh, Lane referred to the fact that they weren't rated at that point when you went to the festival. Right. Were they ever rated before? No, not, rated? most film festivals, what they'll do is they'll program. I, I w went around a lot of different ones around the country, um, and uh, each one would have 
a lot of them would try and program like here's like Holocaust films and things relating to that, or here's this or the, you know these different categories. Um, and a lot of times they'll have like a little blurb about the about the movies. Um, but yeah, generally film festivals don't don't rate the films at all. And a lot of times you know like the major film festivals. You're putting them out there so that some distribution company, someone's going to pick it up and then uh, take on the distribution, and then they would pay to have the MPAA rating, that so kind of thing. So, early pre-release type films that are a lot of a lot of times uh, film festivals are used as a jumping starting ground, especially for uh, independent features to uh, try and get some get some buzz going about their about their films and everything. Um, oh, and what uh, one more thing I, I was thinking about, you know, uh, you like to see a lot of the film well, at ifilm.com you can actually watch like the first eight minutes of a film or something like that and that that might be a good way sometimes they'll say see the first eight minutes of this or something like that so that gives you the full flavor there so but sorry um in terms of the uh, film festivals yeah that's uh um it yeah they don't they don't usually have things that are rated yet especially short film festivals you know short films are usually not rated and so it's up to a group of six people or so that are to decide what's going to be good to program on here, what's going to offend people, you know, or maybe they want to have some stuff that's that's really s strong and shocking. Let's have a midnight showing on this festival or whatever. It's just all it has to do with uh, programming and it, it's all determined. Instead of the MPAA board, it's determined by six people at Hot Springs Documentary Festival or, or you know, different things like that. So. But film festivals also have a, another really important function and, and have for about the past 15 years, which is as the ownership of... Di what studios do now isn't make movies on some studio lot that they own so much. As fun movies, they function as banks for other people to make money, to make movies with their money, and they function as, as distributors, right, for other people's movies. And as the ownership of that mechanism becomes more and more concentrated, we import less and less films, fewer and fewer films from around the world. The United States market right now has just an appalling number, an appallingly small number of foreign films as opposed to other countries in the industrially developed world. Um, and so film festivals, Chicago Film Festival, in, in, you know, in, in any American city, serve as the only place you can see films from, and I, I'm not talking about films from countries that it might be hard to import films from, like Iran, which is actually not that hard, but it seems a little harder, but even films from France and Taiwan that get very little distribution, out, if any, outside of the festival. Most of the world's major directors who are acknowledged by critics around the world and critics in the United States when they can say what's really on their minds who aren't from the United States don't get imported because of the threat of a commercial challenge. Sure, we'll get a film like Amelie because it's easy to pitch, but there's a, for instance, Ho Shao Shin has been trying, he's a Taiwanese director, been trying to show films here for years. Can't get a single bit of U.S. distribution. The films would do okay here, but the only place to see a film like that is at a film festival. And th this guy is, you know, Acknowledged throughout the world as one of the one of the modern masters, so to speak, and so the the film festival, you know, can't afford the the people who bring the film to the festival. The festival itself can't afford to have all these films rated, um, and it's it's really the only place you can see anything but a very narrow segment of of world cinema outside of DVD and videotape distribution. But people who are really really good at making movies on film have the kind of light temperatures that are unique to a projector in, in mind and so they look different when you show them on a TV monitor and it's just something else. You can do very beautiful things with video and DVD but then you're making a video or a DVD. So that's, I mean that's the other thing that a film festival does is a, as well as trying to get distribution it also just is, a, is an end in itself to show things that everybody knows no one will, will pick up because the, the, the few companies that control what you see won't let you see it. That, that's what I meant about capital being the real restriction on intellectual freedom. Um, my final project for my senior, in, when I was a senior in college here, uh, I didn't pay actors anything. I, uh, you know, got props out of dumpsters and all that kind of stuff. And so the only expense was the film. It was a 40-minute comedy. Um, it ended up costing $10,000, and that was just 
film processing, film stock, answer prints, you know. And so now with the digital revolution, I, I think that, um, you, you know, film is nice. I actually, you know, you can actually transfer video to film now and have it a 35 millimeter print. So you can start out with shooting on video, which is a lot less expensive. So I think that that opens up a lot of creative avenues for people um, that, that there's no excuse now if you, if you say, oh, I could never make a film, it's too expensive, it's in the hands of these Hollywood people. Well, you might not be able to get distribution into a motion picture theater, but you can make a film for, you know, you could make it for a hundred bucks. You know, just pay for the tape stock, or you could get someone to donate it, that for, for you. So, really, if you have the inspiration to do something like this, is make whatever vision you want, you can do it. The distribution is another matter. You know, I would like to get stuff on TV, but you know, you're sending it to one person, they say yes or no, and, and you have to live with whatever decisions they make. So um, I think the distribution is, uh, like you were saying, was, uh, you know, as, as there's fewer distribution companies, and there, if, if you're gonna spend $100 million, if, someone, if I'm gonna pull out $100 million out of my pocket, I'm gonna wanna know that I'm gonna make that money back and double it, you know? And so that's why you've got, you know, part two and part three of all these movies or, or things that, you know, a lot of sequels are things based on, on books or you'll, that's why actors can, like Tom Hanks, pay him $30 million. Well, that helps you guarantee, it's, it's ridiculous amount of money, but it helps kind of guarantee that there's gonna be people that are gonna come and wanna see it versus an incredibly great um, uh, theater actor who, who could do 10 times as good a job there's no hook there and in 30 seconds you know you got to hook someone and that's I guess it's kind of unfortunate yeah. anybody else well I just before we go I want to point out that on the back table back there if you want to learn more about the film industry and censorship or the ratings I don't necessarily have to call it censorship we have a bunch of books on the table as well as a bibliography so check it out on your way out and thanks for coming and where can you Here at the library. <laughs> okay, I have to plug the collection. collection. Here at the library, you can get films on video and DVD from countries all over the world. Um, and we. Oh, yes. And this is the Carol Spaziani Intellectual Freedom Festival. And Carol is sitting in the back of the room. So, Carol, thank you for coming. And join us um, next Tuesday for the third part of this year's Intellectual Freedom Festival. Thanks.